and welcome Mr. Bhushan and Danilesh. Uh, it's a privilege uh, uh, to be part of this uh, discussion. Um, I will only lead by questions and I am looking forward to learning a lot about this interesting topic from both of you who have been working in the field for a, a long time. Mr. Bhushan has uh, the experience in actually implementation of uh, information security. Uh, interestingly, coming from the manufacturing uh, uh, segment, where the issues could be slightly different from what we normally uh, see in an IT uh, company. And uh, Mr. Nilesh uh, comes from his consultancy background. So the advantage of being in consultancy is that uh, we try to imbibe the experience of multiple agencies. In fact, I used to be in the merchant banking division and there was one of the things which I always uh, uh, considered as an advantage um, because um, in providing the consultancy, we also absorb experience from a number of uh, institutions. So welcome both of you. Uh, let us uh, start uh, our journey on this interesting uh, topic. Uh, synchronized approach to modernize cyber security. This is what uh, um, Stramit has designated. So let us uh, first of all try to have a common uh, say understanding on the scope of what we are identifying as the uh, requirement of modernizing cyber security. Of course cyber security has been in place for a long time. Uh, now we are talking of synchronization of cyber security across perhaps different platforms, different, uh, uh, let us say, devices. So let us uh, try to find out your perspective uh, on um, how do you define the scope of uh, this discussion, uh, synchronization uh, or synchronized approach to cyber security. Shall we start from Mr. Bhushan? Yeah, sure. I think uh, the the title or topic uh, is, is talking merely about what what it actually means and modernizing cybersecurity. If we take the second part of the sentence first, it is basically what we are trying to say is whatever are the uh, dynamic threat or threat landscape that keeps on changing depending on the wars that are happening, the nation attacks, or even the small phishing based attacks that are happening, and then uh, that the targets are like the end users or the companies that are targeted attacks. And these modernized kind of attacks, you need the modernized cybersecurity. It is not only that you take a single solution and you are done with the, the uh, protection for that particular area. But what we are saying is the attacks are happening at various places. Our attackers are actually finding the, uh, the loopholes in the various places within the IT or the digital environment of any company. And that is where we also need to have the synchronization that wherever there are protection solutions or even the basic IT hygiene practices, I will not even call the protection, the basic IT hygiene practices, wherever they are, they need to be synchronized with, with each other so that you have a complete protection and you can achieve the objective of the actual security that you want to achieve. So that is what uh, my view on this uh, topic. Uh, shall we have the views of uh, Mr. Nilesh? Yes, that's, uh, as Mr. Bhushan actually uh, left that discussion, he is perfectly correct in saying that uh, considering the current, um, what to say, environment or landscape of the different factors, the different factors which have increased over the last couple of years here, especially during the pandemic and the post pandemic time, uh, the different factors have actually um, diversified. So a single uh, approach uh, is uh, now in the last couple of years, uh, uh, can we just see how the technology of cyber security changed? Of course, uh, the one is the threat landscape has changed. Okay. And correspondingly, the defenses also, we must have uh, perhaps uh, uh, made use of modern technology. Now, can we just try to identify uh, what are the new technology developments which have uh, changed the threat landscape, uh, which also perhaps we we'll later on discuss how the same uh, technological developments can uh, assist in uh, finding out solutions to the cyber uh, threats. Um, so back to say Nilesh, uh, um, 
what are the, uh, the new technologies you think uh, has affected in the recent days uh, uh, to change the threat landscape? So I was saying a lot of uh, artificial intelligence, AI based uh, yeah, AI factors based. are uh, being used by the article. So uh, I would actually say like um, there are a lot of technology wherein like um, Tataka say you are using self learning uh, stuff and uh, they first penetrated a network, sit there so for about five to six months, uh, learn about the entire network and then they start attacking. Okay. Now you are also talking about uh, this um, COVID uh, impact where a lot of remote, uh, I mean, uh, handling of uh, the operations of a company started. Along with that, you must have had some challenges uh, for security also, no? Uh, yes, he can work and with the AK, I mean, I rid of the COVID and uh, work from home. See, many organizations were prepared, many companies, they were actually doing, um, giving work from home to the employees first when they were on leave and all that. But uh, like many organizations were not, not prepared for this kind of a uh, scenario. So, uh, you know, uh, work from home or infosec was rolled out in a patch and uh, managed kind of a environment where we, like, bricks and pieces were brought in, they were patched and a service was rolled out to enable the workforce to work from home. So there were a lot of the, um, uh, what you call it, the uh, infosec loopholes which are not patched out which led to the attackers to get inside. Uh, there were also um, in some industries they faced budget restrictions to instantly source and get those equipment so there were no uh, equipments where firewalls and robots were implemented to as a stopgap solution to uh, enable the work from home for the users so all this result all this resulted in the um, threat factors or the attackers getting more advantage of the network and another thing which um, has been like oversight or has not been looked into I recently read a, read a um, partner and a CTF report wherein um, it came out that uh, most of the new age attackers who are uh, behind most of the ransomware and the other uh, attacks are basically infosec professionals who have been laid off by the organization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's a very uh, what it, uh, high threat factor you should say because they know what are the loopholes which uh, they patch, the, they used to patch in their organization and they when they got laid off like they come with that kind of um, high-end knowledge and that's where the actually the threat scenario has totally changed. So we were discussing about the changes in the threat landscape uh, in the last uh, a few years because of uh, the changing technology. Yeah, you were views on that. Yeah, so I would like to add, I mean, definitely COVID played a major oh. role. But uh, what COVID also did was uh, people tried or started using digital platform more and more. So not only in the offices, offices definitely brought the work from anywhere scenario or it, it broadened actually. But apart from that, since the normal users or normal people started using digital technologies in their hands on their mobile phones, even that increased the threat landscape because now uh, the, the same device which was having maybe access of emails of the offices also is now used to do some payments or do some transactions or do some shopping. So that also increased the threat landscape or helped to increase the threat landscape as well as uh, the technology in terms of the offices, like in the manufacturing sector, uh, the machines are connected to each other. There are systems like MES, manufacturing execution system. So the, those are uh, where the internet of things or OT, IOT and OT have also added to the uh, things it, it's not a new thing i mean we remember in uh, 2010 11 there was a stuxnet a stuxnet attack uh, because of which there was a it was on ot platform but that is now increased because now ot systems are giving you the, the power and water and all those things and then the attackers are finding that may be helpful to gain something out of it by by attacking those systems so all these use of technology and the latest last example is of something like chat gpt which people we are saying that it's also helpful and it is also a, a i mean threat for us so so it, from the both side this technology also has added to the overall uh, threat landscape okay so even before this uh, covid affected us and we went uh, to this remote uh, model of work from home 
uh, we had the concept of BYOD, you know, bring your own device. There right. also some similar, uh, uh, say, issues were there in terms of uh, system integrity having been compromised or something like that. Now, uh, how do you differentiate between the challenges which BYOD uh, uh, gave and uh, what uh, we faced in the work from home? Today, I don't think most of the people are not talking about BYOD. I, I don't know whether we have assimilated it as a part of our activities or do as it was, do you still discuss BYOD and uh, how to uh, mitigate the risk? So BYOD is still discussed, but at the level of, I would say, HR to prepare some kind of a policy okay. that whether we want to allow the devices or maybe finance also things from that angle that, okay, to save on the cost, can we allow the devices, personal devices to be used? But what has only changed, I mean, the security also evolved along with that. But earlier we used to talk it as a VPN that, okay, whether it's an office device or a personal device, you give a virtual private network access and and that's it so you ask the username and password and the user is authorized and then he can use the applications that are allowed but what concept came after these all challenges was the zero trust network architecture so it's not only one username and password or maybe one authentication you are asking you are asking multiple questions you are doing multiple checks for the user and that is where if at all all those checks are passed then only the access is allowed and it's not only that access is allowed one time and whatever you are doing after that access is allowed, then you are continuously monitoring that. So that that complete uh, journey of that user from logging into logging off, it is also monitored and checked whether uh, the user behavior is as per what is expected. So I think zero trust got superseded with the VPN technology. And then as you rightly said, BYOD took a backseat and what we started calling as work from anywhere, work from home. Okay, Nilesh, uh, can you add something to what he has said? The journey from the old BYOD to Zero Trust and uh, VPN, what is your uh, take on that? No, you are on move mute. I, I it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, what I was saying is that what Mr. Munson just thought is actually uh, 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 um, perfectly right. Like with the advent of the Zero Trust framework. Um, many organizations, or I should say 90% of the operators have already adopted the Zero Trust framework. And like uh, BYOD concept, he has actually taken a back seat now. It's like work from anywhere. Like uh, use any device, work from anywhere. Uh, people have gone up to the uh, big organizations like AppDevon and they have actually gone up to the extent of sending uh, desktops to their users. I am aware of uh, Accenture and uh, uh, CapGemini and who have actually sent out the uh, uh, what you call the devices and with monitors to the developers during the COVID period to their home. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, so, so organizers have gone up to that level. So, BYOD concept, yes, still, it's still there in some sectors like your, I should say, in the TME segment. Mostly in the media segment, people are still on the BYOD when people like to work on their own Mac devices and all that. So, organizers have been uh, put in those policies and they create shells within the Macs and um, bring in the devices into the corporate framework. But uh, with the advent of the uh, ZTN and the, and the Zero Trust framework, yes, um, work from anywhere is, is the in thing now. Fine, but another thing, yeah, sorry. Another thing which has happened. Has this work from anywhere uh, really posed a big threat to the security? Or are we, see, we were constrained to use it because during COVID there was no option. Now that, um, that compulsion is not there. Most of the organizations are asking the workforce to come back to office, whereas many of the workers, at least in the IT industry, uh, still prefer to work from home because for them, unlike a manufacturing industry, the need to, to be present in the office premises is a little uh, uh, less than in the case of a manufacturing uh, company. So there is, there is a feeling in some IT companies, at least, uh, that uh, employees still want to enjoy the, if you want to call it as enjoyment, yes, uh, okay, you know, uh, of working from home. Whereas organizations are uh, still worried. Um, they were worried earlier also, I, 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 am, uh, I suppose, but they had to compromise because there was no other alternative kind of a thing. Now, of course, uh, they don't want to continue to take that risk. Is that perception correct? That is perception of people like us who are slightly outside the actual uh, uh, domain. 
Yeah, Mr. Bhushan, you want to say something on that? Yeah, I feel so because the risk is not not only about uh, the data security. There are other factors also, like people talk about moonlighting and maybe whatever you call it. But yeah. then, from the data security point of view, if we want to focus more, yes, people or the companies or the leadership don't want to take more risks about the data leakage or the the what you can say the controlling factor has to be increased because ultimately everyone knows a, a fact of the security that i i do all the kind of protection if the integrity of the person is that to leak something he will do it by any means right so so whatever data i have in front of me my cameras are so intelligent i can take the photos and then prepare a file out of it so i can still do it which doesn't have any kind of protection then what protection comes is only the statutory kind of thing that you if you find doing these kind of things uh, you will be taken disciplinary actions but what i am trying to say is integrity is at a question every time so it is better that we are able to control the team or the people and the data it's when we change our own visibility in the offices and that is where i think there is always a requirement that okay work from home should stop and then so there people should start coming to office back this is what uh, my understanding okay we will come to this a little uh, uh, later but uh, the other uh, shift which we are seeing is of course in the storage uh, say we now cloud storage has become more or less uh, a common uh, thing now to what extent cloud storage uh, affects your security posture uh, mr uh, bushan yeah certainly it affects I mean cloud storage as a as a storage or a central repository is very useful so i wanted to also add to my earlier point that security is not only about protecting right protecting our confidentiality is one part of the security but what what we learn in iso and even the any any courses that we do for security it's it's not only confidentiality it's availability and integrity also so the data should be available to the right people at right time uh, always it should not happen that okay we have put some controls and because of that their official work or the productivity is getting hampered so yes this cloud storage has made that angle very effective that that, that data is available at your fingertips as and when you need it now how to use it again again it's a integrity factor of the person that i have got the data where should i copy it what should i do with that it's a different point but yes it is available it makes me productive at the same time it is dangerous also because if you don't have the tools like whatever we call as mobile device management or the data protection on handheld devices then definitely there is a risk of that data getting copied to other devices copied to some other people and that is where this angle of data protection as from the tools also and from the statutory or the procedural controls also comes in picture but definitely cloud storage is is come up as a very good useful tool Mr. Nilesh, uh, see when we talk of uh, data protection, okay, as uh, uh, that is uh, trying to safeguard the data as it uh, resides inside a kind of a device versus the perimeter kind of uh, security. Uh, there is a debate about uh, the advantages and disadvantages of uh, a centralized repository of uh, uh, data. versus a decentralized or a distributed uh, repository of data particularly uh, when we discuss uh, data protection uh, you know that in the data protection uh, legal uh, scenario uh, in gdpr and uh, other things there is a concept of uh, the data subject exercising his right to erasure or uh, say right to be forgotten and at that time the organization will be required to Uh, perhaps issue an assurance certificate that the, his data has been removed from where all it was present in my uh, network which means that identifying the location of a particular piece of personal data uh, in within the organizational network becomes a huge challenge so sometimes we try to suggest that uh, the organization should consider Uh, centralization of at least the personal data so that if when it comes to the removal or something like that uh, you can definitely say it is no longer available there and rest of the processing will have to take uh, the 
uh, take on the concept of something like this virtual desktop kind of a thing so that uh, it calls the personal data processors and subsequently a copy does not reside in the um, system of the um, employee so does this uh, concept of uh, centralized uh, data storage um, really uh, appeal to you mr nilesh see with my experience like uh, both as a cio and a cso uh, i've been a bit there i would be in operating and i have worked as a cso in the top of the and now in a consulting role so uh, i would take take on a decentralized approach uh, with your uh, classification of pi and spdi data the pi and spdi are uh, basically tagged using a uh, like p organizations which process uh, this kind of data and store them see there there is two of two things one is like you process the data and you discard it or you um, like uh, you destroy the data second is you process and store the data so this is uh, particularly uh, for organizations which uh, store pi and spdi data basically now what they are doing is that they are allocating allocating a unique id to each and every uh, individual so every pi and spdi uh, is mapped to a unique id for each and every registered user so that registered user can be an uh, in-house employee can, it can be a client or it can be a third party who is talking with them or can be a vendor so everyone is allocated a unique data so even if the data is distributed so once uh, once the uh, data is tagged with unique id it's become very easy to uh, recall and destroy that data in case of any uh, uh, litigations comes in or any kind of legal request comes in to identify and uh, erase this kind of data from an, from a particular individual so things have become very use uh, very useful with lots of technologies currently available at the fingertips only thing is that the organization needs to invest in them the, the senior management needs to have a appetite and understanding of what data security is which sometimes is very difficult for for various industries like i, I personally worked in a manufacturing industry and mr bhushan with that will agree with me when working in a manufacturing industry sometimes it becomes very difficult to get a management buy in for a, a infosec investment why is it required why do we need to classify the data on a pi or spdi basis so yes once the management uh, uh, you get the buy in from the management it becomes very easy for data classification and there are lots of uh, tools available to audio it automatically cl classify the information and tag them so if and if you are storing your data across multiple cloud storages like um, i know of organizations who use uh, oracle um, cloud uh, azure and uh, aws in a combination like entire hrms is on oracle your flat files are on aws and other files are on the azure cloud and these organizations are, are have deployed tools which makes it easy to identify this kind of data so and once an employee exits except for a few tagging and uh, related employee related information all pi data is erased from the system so in uh, say in the past you would have actually evolved the data storage uh, through multiple platforms for various historical reasons now suppose uh, a new law comes um, li like with what may happen in india suddenly the security people will have to respond to the new situation in fact just as we are talking of synchronization with the modernization of technology like advent of uh, ai etc advent of a new security related law is also something which the cisos should look at how to synchronize with uh, the requirements of the compliance officer um okay that is where uh, this uh, question of uh, centralization of pi came now uh, mr bushan when uh, we talk of decentralized uh, holding of data are we talking of uh, holding the full set of data in different uh, places or are we talking of uh, splitting the uh, one data set itself and holding it at multiple places so that the security uh, will be higher in the sense that uh, this uh, at the time of processing you actually call the data elements from multiple sources and process it and later on allow it to spread out so that any data leakage of one particular storage space will not perhaps reveal the entire data is that kind of decentralization uh, 
are uh, uh, is feasible i doubt about that <coughs> this may not be the right thing because when we are saying decentralization maybe i can use the word uh, pseudo centralization because <coughs> earlier we used to have <coughs> file servers and then data are stored at various locations including your end devices <coughs> nowadays the practice has changed mm. so your one drive most of the uh, patients use office 365 or maybe google the google drive or one drive whatever the data is getting stored over there so your official data again it's centralized over there your business related data when you talk about the employee data or the hr data most of the organizations are going for a software as a service uh, i will not name the companies but yes they are providing these kind of service so all that employee related data is at that place okay you have integrations or you have Uh, connections with that application with your other applications but the data is uh, being residing over there so if we say that for hr data uh, or the human data hr is responsible they have been given that task of okay, you maintain your data you maintain all these consents and all these things and then uh, you maintain that so that centralization has happened at that level for that kind of data same way and then you talk about the the business data in terms of the transactions so erp related data is, is get stored in the erp related storages so what i'm saying is okay that even though this decentralization has happened it has happened with respect to the type of the data and that is where already you are doing uh, what what protection is required but the the most most important point which mr nilesh also addressed is the classification so wherever the data is whether it is classified whether the company has the classification policy in place the tool if required in place and whether the people are really doing it so is there a mindset that that whether it is really required to be done and then automatic automatic uh, labeling and automatic classification is anyway there but then people should understand that if i am sending some confidential data i whether i have classified it as a confidential then the tools will work properly to protect that so that's where centralization at various places has happened and then uh, that is where we will we will not always be centralized uh, that is the approach that required data is going to the required uh, central storage in most of this cloud storage uh, do you use uh, encryption in storage as a requirement uh, uh, or do you do that along with uh, encryption in transmission also Yeah, Nilesh, you want to say thing? Uh, right. So, data in motion uh, uh, and data at rest. That's what we call it. So, data in motion refers to data while in transit, and data at rest is basically with the stored data which is stored on a particular device on a server or on a cloud. Our uh, as a standard is basically encrypted models, and I believe like most of the cover the operators they have uh, uh, the CISOs in the organization or the CIOs they have implemented uh, encryption. If not, I would say it's a need of the hour because yes, um, data whichever data you are uh, you are keeping, whether it's a PII, SPDI, financial data, needs to be encrypted. Um, Bhushan, now how do you handle the key storage issues uh, uh, in when you actually encrypt the data uh, in storage? Uh, 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 because uh, you have to also protect against accidental loss of uh, you know, the keys or other things. So, how does this key storage policy affect uh, the encryption usage? So, definitely it affects. And whenever you are looking for any encryption solution, I think the first and foremost thing uh, you should check is what is the key management uh, technology being used there, or whether the only keys are generated and some other solution has to manage those keys. solutions are available that way also but again when when we are calling this topic is synchronization i am always linking it with the processes of the company and processes which are followed by it or some frameworks like iso 27001 so if you have already developed a policy for key management and key protection your it team is aware that okay we are encrypting something the keys have to be protected and more or less data in transit is getting protected or encrypted anyways because Uh, http nowadays is not allowed uh, every site has to be https so that way you are encrypting the, the traffic ftp also nobody is now publishing any file transfer data on the as a without security so you are sftp or ftps kind of things so mostly what they happen is the storage encryption which could be a challenge in terms of key management or even the 
with the speed mm -hmm. and if at all there is any challenge the recovery of that data so there are challenges like that but i think uh, they have to be handled along with the tool that mm -hmm. you are looking for and the processes that you follow see another important aspect of uh, security is of course authentication now with this movement of technology from whatever it was uh, say 3 years back to the current uh, days and maybe in the next one year or two years has the authentication technology um, I have been mean, uh, changed a lot and uh, how is it uh, changing bushan you can give uh, your views then we can finish yeah yeah so authentication as we said yes it is changing or rather it has changed oh. and multi factor authentication as we call it has has evolved uh, as i mean it has become a this thing we have to go for it because there is no choice multi factor authentication has to be there so what you know is your password and what you have is the code that you get or otp that you get on on any device or any authenticator and once all these things are met then only you are allowed or authenticated so definitely multi factor authentication has has taken a uh, precedence and it has become a, a de facto thing apart from that there are multiple other thing passwordless authentication or uh, multi multi factor you ask some questions if you find that there is a risk for a particular user you ask more questions or you force even some users to change the password at that time so there are additional factors yes authentication has definitely avoided a lot yeah nilesh uh, he, uh, mr bushan was talking about this uh, multi multi authentication i think that is what uh, sometimes we call as adaptive authentication i suppose right. uh, what is your view on this changing of the technology of authentication as it is happening in the last couple of uh, years mm -hmm. um see if you look at the latest uh, security tools uh, in the authentication segment uh people are implementing uh, machine learning uh, in authentication mm -hmm. so what it does is that um, it uh, monitors the user's login behavior yes so so that actually takes care of any impersonation so mm -hmm. the, for example like, um, there is some um, Ill, uh, irregular behavior of the observed for a particular user whether in the office or while uh, working from home uh then the um, multi multi factor authentication sets in whether in the user is provided to put in a uh, respond to a captcha or respond to certain set questions which were there um recorded earlier so yes uh, so machine learning is playing a uh, good amount of role in the authentication segment artists now with the advancement of uh, chat gpt kind of uh, developments um have we uh are, are we threatened about the developments in terms of security or are we happy that uh, we can use it for uh as you said now uh, some kind of um, advantageous situation of uh, finding out the behavior of the person or something like that what how do you look at chat gpt is it a positive impact or a negative impact for security yeah nilesh uh, can you can give you a yes. i i should, i i would i have i keep a standpoint say that every technology has both the uh, good side and the flip side i not say the back the bad side i would say the good side and the flip side yes chat gpt has its own uh, good good positive sides and it is also good for the hackers also who are uh, actually using it uh, to uh, like uh, get stuff without writing a code now you talked about this behavioral analysis now yeah. can uh, chat gpt at least gpt4 can it mimic the Uh, I mean, <laughs> uh, behavior of the user better than one. If, for example, if you see zero GPT actually started working in the beginning, I think yeah. now new zero GPT. I think uh, the GPT has learned how to. Uh, so I mean, uh, I mean, evade the uh, zero GPT. Likewise, the yeah, chat GPT has been used to write codes for malware, which can defeat the antivirus uh, software. So. like that to this behavioral analysis what you are talking of but through machine learning can also be overridden uh, don't you think so yes it can be yes so that actually is a threat factor yes as i said every technology has a good side and a flip side so yes so, so you can a threat factor chat gpt is a <laughs> is a threat factor <laughs> okay is there is not technology of that yeah technology technology will keep on innovating uh, yeah and, and so the cisos have to evolve Okay, okay. Bushan, what is your view on this uh, Chat GPT development, uh, particularly as we go into the GPT four? Yeah. 
Yeah, certainly. So I agree. I mean, there, there are there cannot be a firm view oh. that whether it is good or bad because yes, any oh. anything can be used for constructive as well as destructive purposes. What uh, becomes more important is again the same thing that the user awareness, the simulation things that we keep on doing as a part of our. Uh, uh, learning for the end user that you should do this, you should not do this. Tips for the do's and don'ts. I think that should increase along with the examples from those chat GPT things. That okay, this also could be happen uh, happening. Please be aware of this and don't do it. So ultimately, it comes to the person or the human that is actually going to do the transaction or maybe in the answers to the phishing things. So that is where that awareness factor comes more and it becomes more important as a part of your all. Uh, other things and definitely the synchronized security even if something happens because of chat gpt whether you have the other protection that at least at one layer or second layer or third layer somewhere the the attack or whatever is uh, the misconduct that is happening can be stopped and identified and stopped so it's a combination of uh, protection technologies and the uh, human behavior through awareness uh, has there been any change in the ransomware technology the the recent days uh, after the advent of AI, have you observed anything? Yeah, uh, definitely, uh, definitely it has. Because see, ransomware ultimately, what what we have learned is now normal antiviruses of new use. Earlier we used to say signature based, and you update the signature every week or as and when they come, and then you are protected. Now it's all gone. Everybody knows that antivirus is not at all sufficient. What you need is something as a behavior based or traffic behavior. So PDRs came in picture. People are talking of MDR also, XDR also. So definitely this ransomware has brought this change. And ransomware also keep on changing the kind of the attacks that they are doing, the technologies that they are doing. And then we are coming back to the older class or back to the basics that how we are uh, doing our the reviews of our firewalls, perimeter security, cloud security, or even endpoint security. So ultimately, if you are doing continuous reviews and you see you're updating the things as and when they are required, then I think uh, you, are, you are safe and perfect. So, Nilesh, you can add anything to what uh, Mr. Bhushan was saying? Yeah, uh, but they act on the call. At the end of the new tech, even the ransomware, ransom um, what do you say, the way of attack or the attack factor of the ransomware is also learning. So, um, it, like uh, nowadays, even the uh, intuition prevention system, which uh, uh, like uh, organizers are implementing, like if you are going into the level of implementing XDR, so, which has an algorithm which uh, is self learning or which uh, observes for any anomaly behavior within the networks. So, yes, so prevention, um, it depends from organization to organization. If you are in an organization where the your risk exposure is high, um, like the risk exposure or the um, what is risk impact for a ransomware of your organization is high, then yes, you need to uh, implement that kind of strategy to overcome it. If you're a small organization, you think, okay, my the ransomware attack doesn't impact my operation too much, I can about to have a system shut down, a five system shut down for a couple of hours or a couple of days. It's all the, like, um, it's a uh, difference of the risk exposure of the organization. Now, uh, if chat GPT is considered a threat, now uh, as a CISO, uh, what, how do you plan mitigation of the chat GPT risk? Can you just uh, uh, give a couple of examples of chat GPT risks and how you would uh, like to change your approach to security in your organization to address only the chat gpt risk let us leave the other things for which uh, side now only chat gpt risk mitigation of chat gpt risk if that is the project what are the things you would like to consider mm. both of you one by one uh, you can uh, say yeah. bushan you want to go first yeah sure so i think i already uh, addressed it partially <coughs> So first and foremost thing, we will have to increase the simulation uh, and the simulation and the training coming out of the simulation to the end users. Okay. okay. Earlier we were only talking that business email compromise. You will get so and so email and it will ask you to click something and then do not click or you first check, cross check and then move. Now you have to add uh, the things of simulation from the 
chat GPT like things or the chat bots related things that are coming up. Uh, so that is first and foremost, and it's and it will and I think that is the base that you have to increase the root um, focus on the root cause and ensure that whatever happens, the user will not at least act on it as a part of the machine engine or those kind of things. Secondly, of course, then again, what comes is uh, whenever there is a new technology implementation, see who will use this chat GPT-like technologies. HR will use it maybe for, for getting some good answers and getting some good analysis. Businesses might use it so, so that practice of security shift left kind of thing that okay don't ask us to do the checking or testing of the software or an application after you have decided or after you have implemented let us know it beforehand we will first go and check whether it is really correct what whoever is the service provider whether they have the right security practices the so third party security risk assessment the right due diligence for allowing that application to be implemented at our organization and then going ahead. So I think, again, all of these are very, what you can say, preventive measures that we can do. And then finally, yeah. the, the, the evolving technologies who can also protect from the such kind of attacks, definitely you have to keep on updating your knowledge and then also implement them at, at your organization. Yeah, Nilesh, chat GPT risk. Yeah, I think we should cover it all. So, yes, um, it should be first authorized and approved by the InfoSec team and like uh, as I said, shift grip should be the um, option that should be always be there. So uh, the HR should not come and say that boss, we have already onboarded this uh, vendor and we are going at this implementation. And then it comes to the InfoSec team to do a risk assessment. No, I think that uh, like we should come out from that approach and like any new technology, yes, it's, uh, it's by default comes to the InfoSec, but then it should come to the InfoSec first. Is there any HR issue associated with the use of uh, chat GPT? Uh, because I think uh, some organizations are even thinking of, uh, uh, I don't know whether is, that is the right word, banning chat GPT in the network. Uh, is, does it work or uh, are we trying to uh, regulate uh, a natural tendency of workforce to start using chat GPT? either for uh, writing some emails or uh, I understand for coding and testing. There, there are many useful purposes uh, which can be done. But uh, is there any HR issue involved in accepting or rejecting chat GPT usage in the corporate environment? Yeah, Bhushan? I think so far, at least we have not come across that situation because still we are learning and reading the content. And uh, so and so once it gets matured or at least come to some stage where we have to take some decision, I think at that time it will be a discussion between us, uh, that is IT, uh, security, HR uh, and the business teams. But so far uh, it's, it's a kind of wait and watch till now. It's not come to any decision that it should be blocked or allowed or controlled. Okay, Nilesh? Yeah, uh, I know a couple of organizations have already started taking steps towards black blocking chat unless it reaches a maturity level. So, yes, people are scared, like, what, what can be the impact of it? So, many uh, organizations are uh, taking a stand of wait and watch till there is a regulatory uh, regulation or still it reaches a maturity level. Because, see, anything new is always either scary or lovely. Uh, of course, uh, it will become part of your threat assessment or security assessment as we uh, go along. And... Um, uh, also, I am also uh, to some extent worried about the addiction mm. uh, kind of a thing which can happen to the people, our own employees. But today, we don't allow them to go to some websites or something like that for a particular reason. But uh, we may not restrict them to go to uh, use chat GPT. Now, <laughs> chat GPT can substitute all your pornographic websites in terms of conversation if you, if you allow. Uh, okay, so... Uh, there is uh, a possibility of chat GPT becoming a uh, kind of an addiction for the employees, uh, particularly if the supervision uh, is lax. Okay, we don't want to actually monitor our employees uh, all, all the time, what exactly they are doing. Uh, but this is one uh, thing, like uh, every employee has a child in him. So like that, uh, so... Uh, Chat GPT is a very interesting uh, phenomena. You are having somebody to talk to. When you don't want to talk to your boss, you can talk to uh, the Chat GPT. So there is a psychological, uh, say, 
uh, issue um, where uh, um, chat gpt can start hurting the productivity of uh, employees uh, along with helping um, in certain areas if everybody is actually very rational and uses technology only for good things then we don't have any problem at all but as managers of security you have to also look at the possibility of misuse of the technology so maybe you have to look at the assessment like that now one more point which um, i have been um, discussing with some security people is there is one view of um, security professionals <coughs> who say that uh, they would like to use tor browsers in the corporate network and it helps in security uh, now what is uh, your uh, view mr bushan uh, and I, I, i didn't get it they would like to use what tor tor browser that is onion router uh, browser because they say security will be enhanced uh, by using tor browser in whatever way they want to in the internal uh, uh, network so what is uh, your view as a security person uh, on the use of tor browsers within the corporate network mm -hmm. yeah would you first answer definitely would be uh, no for that because as we are no dark browsers are used mainly uh, by the attackers of the dark web what we call as and already it's a fear that our company data might be getting sold on the dark web or the attackers are already misusing that to conduct the attacks if if that uh, allowing of that uh, browsers becomes a practice then maybe the the chances of getting data leaked will be increasing is not i feel no no we should not all right okay nilesh yeah same view point uh, i am totally against the use of this browser in the corporate network yes go and use it at your home but not in my office good 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 conservative approach which i also appreciate uh, how okay. actually actually see what i think it's a uh, see it gives a over uh, exposure to the dark web uh, which is basically with creating a warm hole inside your Uh, or inside your upper network, it can be good if you are pronging outside. But if the yeah. prong comes from the outside to the in internal network, it's very dangerous. Okay, good. Uh, so, uh, friends, actually, we have discussed the current uh, security scenario. We have also seen uh, some changes which are happening uh, of late, and um, how it is changing the threat uh, landscape. and uh, to some extent we have discussed about how do we um, uh, synchronize the different kinds of uh, uh, technology challenges and uh, try to find some solution uh, out of that does uh, standardization in terms of iso and other things help you in this process uh, do you think it is helping you or uh, is it uh, still not uh, mature enough to look at this um, integration of multiple technologies uh, which will build over a particular period of time does is work or how would i address it yeah uh, i think uh, my apologies i will have to disconnect within 2 3 minutes because it's already uh, yeah very we'll, uh, we'll close it with the final remark yeah yeah so so yes standardization yeah. in terms of your procedural controls has to be there i always uh, prefer that that before any technology solution or along with the technology solution you have to have the standardization you are not any standard is not uh, mandatory for any specific standard but based on your industry and based on requirements anyway you have to follow certain compliances so that standard is always required or standardization is always required but when it comes to the uh, kind of security solutions when you talk about i think standardization is still will take a lot of time people always talk that okay one solution should talk to other and then you should at least the well, not synchronization is happening but the reasons also whether when, whether i can have a single dashboard to view what is happening in my network and what is getting what should be protected i think it will take time but that's any really wish list for any cso on base thank you bushan and nilesh uh, we had an excellent uh, discussion on this interesting topic synchronizing the cyber security efforts of an organization both of you of course come from intense uh, industry experience and our uh, viewers will be very much uh, enriched by their uh, knowledge of course when we talk of a uh, cyber security synchronization of multiple technologies we know that uh, 
in the recent past the development of uh, technologies like uh, artificial intelligence and uh, use of uh, new uh, methodologies in presenting a company to the world like the metaverse they all uh, increase the complexities of uh, the system so the same complexities also reflect in terms of security we have imbibed multiple technologies over a period of time different organs of the uh, company would be working on different uh, <clears throat> versions of some uh, software some some uh, things which are compatible some are not compatible so there will be difficulties in synchronizing the cyber security efforts from let us say the data security level to the perimeter security there are too many complications to work uh, on of course uh, at one layer we can discuss about the technology layer uh, where uh, these complexities come and uh, how we try to use uh, new methods like um, multi factor authentication advanced biometrics adaptive authentication and such things to our existing let us say password based authentication so similarly use of virtual desktop uh, use of centralized or decentralized data storage these are all issues which uh, make the work of a ciso very very uh, complicated but at the same time very um, interesting i'm sure uh, that uh, experienced uh, uh, technology persons will be able to find solutions based on a comprehensive risk uh, uh, analysis which they may have to do but one point i would like to specifically point out is that the synchronization of cyber security efforts should also be uh, worked at the other layer where there is a need to synchronize the technology related security with the policy level security measures where compliance becomes an important issue today in corporate circles the top management is concerned about non compliance to various regulations because uh, that will lead to very serious uh, consequences particularly in uh, laws such as uh, data protection laws now laws actually have started prescribing the technology requirements there was a time when law was silent on technology and um, sometimes uh, as we have done in india we use the terminology like reasonable security um, being uh, sufficient for legal compliance in which case the organization can define what is reasonable security based on its own perception of the environment and the recent developments and try to justify that this is the best practice which we can develop for our organization but there are certain regulations where technology prescription is built into the guidelines sometimes these guidelines come separately um, as rules and notifications sometimes they are part of the uh, legal uh, statute itself so when lawmakers try to actually define what technology should be used and how it should be used i think that is where more complications come in to the corporate circles because now understanding the law and converting it into the technology related controls is something which only a techno legal person can do a pure security person will find it very difficult to um, achieve that so as we go forward we should look at not only synchronizing the multiple technologies involved but also the multiple stakeholders in the organization like the requirements of a data protection officer requirements of a compliance officer and of course the business always has its own uh, priorities so the synchronization of cyber security um, if suppose is not properly done it will have a reflection on the uh, cyber insurance requirements so that the cfo also would be in, uh, involved so across the different stakeholders in an organization how do we synchronize the uh, requirements of multiple divisions 
becomes one of the challenges which the technology people need to uh, solve. I hope uh, the discussion which we had with Mr. Bhushan and Nilesh today uh, will open our eyes as to the complexities involved in the synchronization of technology issues and probably later on extend this to how do we bring in the requirements of other layers of uh, say law policy business into this synchronization uh, module. Uh, I hope uh, the discussions have been useful and uh, we will perhaps continue this sort of discussion in subsequent uh, occasions and enrich all of us with this new knowledge. Thank you. For more updates from CXO TV, please like and subscribe to our channel.